Welcome back. I'm still in Moldova and actually still waiting. Waiting for what? I flew here yesterday. I had three flights, Edinburgh to London, London to Bucharest, Romania, and then from there to Chisinau here in Moldova. And yes, my baggage was lost. Uh, so some people were very kind to me and I'm okay right now. It was actually very encouraging to land uh, in Moldova because it was well below freezing. And for some reason, Scotland was just getting a bit too warm. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of snow last month, but this month, a little too warm. At any rate, we're not supposed to worry about our possessions. We saw that last time. The first talk was treasures and eyeballs. Last time was mammon and worry. Um, yeah, they lost my bags. Well, firstly, this has happened to me a number of times, so it's not a big deal. But I can see that some people would be totally panicked um, if they lost their suitcases. But, you know, it's just suitcases. <laughs> For me, in my case, it's just clothes, toiletries, some books, nothing that can't be replaced, nothing that's truly important. None of this is the treasure in heaven we should be searching for. But anyway, so good evening from Chile, Moldova, and today's message is called Today and Tomorrow. You'll see why I called it that in just a moment, but it's Sermon on the Mount Q. So we're uh, at point Q right now, or I guess you could say the 17th installment. Very familiar verses, but I'm really hoping you'll see them in a different light because of what we've learned uh, from the second half of Matthew 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew 6, 33, 34. Some people read this as though if you put God first, he'll make you rich. Those who believe in the health and wealth gospel, a destructive and biblically dangerous doctrine. When he says, I'll give you all these things, he's not saying wealth. He's saying, I'll take care of the basics, absolute basics, you know, so you don't die. Food, drink, clothes, right? And of course, not, not all Christians even get that when they see God because many are in prison. But... Generally speaking, for most people, the promise is for basic living standard, not luxury. Well, let's, uh, let's explore this. It's only two verses. This is part three. It's the last installment in this uh, subsection on money. But I want us to understand the true context of these very famous verses. We're to seek first God's kingdom, not mammon, not life's necessities. Because God promises he'll give those to us. Kingdom. Well, the kingdom of God, it is a reign. Reign is a ruling that is now and not yet. It's already happening, but it's not fully realized yet. The kingdom of God is an invasion from heaven that comes in waves. The kingdom is a gift to be received. It is a realm to be entered and the kingdom is totally unlike the kingdom of this world. It's bonded to the church, but it's not the same as the church. In short, it's a life to be lived. I'm quoting from a book by my friends Tom Jones and Steve Brown called The Kingdom of God. And certainly, the kingdom is not the church. Going to church is only one small part of seeking the kingdom. And there are plenty of people who go to church regularly who are not seeking the kingdom. Because kingdom living means trusting Jesus as Lord. Kingdom coming is God's will being done. So in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. These are parallel. The more we do God's will, the more we prepare the way for the Christ, the more the kingdom is manifesting itself. Now, that's a good place to be. Kingdom is realm and rule. Realm, which in Jesus' case is the entire universe, right? And rule, even though many are disobedient let's say, unwilling subjects of the kingdom, yet everyone's potentially in the kingdom. Uh, but particularly the kingdom are those who freely choose to serve God. There's no opportunity to freely choose to serve God after death, at least not if I understand the Bible. We choose now because this is our only shot. Seek his kingdom and righteousness. Now, righteousness is not so much a justification through the blood of Christ. There's something to that, but that's not what it normally means in the New Testament. It means, or the Old Testament, it means desiring justice. 
especially justice for others, especially justice for those who cannot take care of themselves, those who have no voice, who are not powerful. And we're told to love and uphold God's holy standard. Sometimes that means helping people stay warm. <laughs> Actually very encouraging to be able to, to give things to help people, not just to give money, but here's some clothes. Here's some furniture we don't need. Here's something that we might use, but, you know, I'd probably just use the money on something frivolous. Why don't you take it? Righteousness is, has to do with how we treat others. It's not a personal uh, status between you and God. That's, that really misses the point. In fact, if, if we don't understand that, it's not righteousness anyway. It doesn't matter how many times you've prayed or gotten baptized. Uh, again, I must emphasize Jesus speaks of the basics in our previous passage, Matthew 6, 25 following, not luxuries. All these things will be added unto you. Not everything on your wish list, but items on your need list. Now, don't, don't think that my wife and I haven't prayed for some things we really wanted that we didn't technically need, but it made life easier or it was helpful. Sure, I'm not saying that that's sinful, but what's sinful is to worship mammon or to not trust God because we're greedy. So all these things. But even then, Jesus speaks generally. Some disciples of Christ, the very poor, persecuted, imprisoned, struggle to make it even day by day. That just means there's more chance for us to help. I'd like to share from two of the early Christians. Uh, we'll hear from Chrysostom, again, of Constantinople, and also Clement of Alexandria, uh, Egypt. And he speaks of Jesus, and Clement says, Jesus says very eloquently, all these things the Gentiles seek after, the, the indulgence, uh, all these things the Gentiles seek after. The Gentiles are self-indulgent and foolish. What are these things which he specifies? Luxury, indulgence, expensive cooking, dainty foods, gluttony. These are things the Gentiles seek. However, when it comes to plain necessary food, both dry and liquid, he says, your father knows you need these. Now, I'm not here to try to change your diet. I did share before water is my favorite beverage. It's not the only one I like, but by far the one I drink the most. You know, if we simplify our lives, even simplify what we eat and drink, we can avoid a lot of harm, a lot of pain. And wanting to impress people or just eat at expensive restaurants, showing off, what is that? Uh, be careful, be careful. Now, I, I know Jesus commended the woman who anointed him with very expensive oil. So it's not that all expensive purchases are ruled out. Just don't be controlled by these things, or by the image. Now, to um, Asia Minor, John Chrysostom. When God sees that we are not riveted to the things of this life, then he gives these needs to us. When he sees that we set a higher value on spiritual things, then he also bestows on us material things. But he does not provide the material things first, lest we break away from the spiritual things. I think that's probably generally true, right? So I, I like that, that phrase, God sees that we're not riveted to the things of this life. <laughs> like you, you're attached and you can't possibly break away. But then he takes care of our needs. And often I've seen a generous person really blessed by the Lord financially, right? But some people are just rich financially and they pretend to be generous. Well, that's condemned earlier in chapter 6. At any rate, there's no promise of luxuries. The abundant life... John 10, 10, life to the full. It's not a middle-class lifestyle, let alone a life of riches, which is falsely promised by the prosperity preachers. No, the abundant life is really not about money and possessions at all. Well, that's the today, because he said, don't be anxious about tomorrow, tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day or for today is its own trouble. And <laughs> probably found that's true. Every day has its own trouble, things we could worry about opportunities to surrender to God. But let's talk about the tomorrow. Again, I don't think Jesus is saying, don't plan. Don't plan education, or if you're a farmer, don't make any plans for your fields, or don't make any financial plans. In fact, the Proverbs, if anything, would tell us that we need to make good plans and with good advice. But there's a big difference between the wisdom of anticipation, forethought, wise planning, and the foolishness of fretting about things we can't change or things that may not happen anyway. 
yeah, I know the world could end tomorrow. There could be an earthquake here. Uh, there could be a flood. Your house could burn down. I mean, you could worry about all kinds of things that might or might not happen. But even if they did happen, we're still to have faith. And there's a big difference between the wisdom of anticipation and planning in a wise way and the foolishly fretting. That's worrying and expending all this energy about things that don't really matter. Really, it's all about faith. Our next message is on judging, and we'll be in Matthew 7. So two chapters down, one to go as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. So I look forward to seeing you. Probably I'll be in Scotland then, and it'll be Sermon on the Mount R from Matthew 7, 1. Maybe read that first paragraph just to be prepared. God bless you, and thank you for listening, and goodbye from Chile, Moldova.